Good morning, everybody. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Katalin Meiroshu. I'm a project development officer with uh, Terena, and I'll be chairing this session. The title of the session is Dude, Where's My Bandwidth? And it's about network monitoring. It's about how to troubleshoot end-to-end -end problems uh, in long-distance wide area networks that are deployed in the end range today. Our first speaker is uh, Shimon Troka. He's from uh, PSNC, the um, Polish NREN. And he received his uh, MSc on computer science from Poznan University of Technology. Uh, he's head of the management unit at PSNC. And he's currently involved in planning and implementing network management applications. Since 2004, he has led the personal uh, activities in PSNC. Shimon. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope we will have enough fresh air here to survive. Um, I'm going to uh, describe you and to give an overview how the European research community is implementing the multi-domain monitoring service. So I will start with a brief introduction to the persona activity, which serves as a basis of the multi-domain monitoring service. Then I will show you what user groups we target, what kind of metrics and measurements uh, are measured within the service, and what service support we offer in order to satisfy our users. Finally, I will end with a description of the trial phase and going into operational for the MDM service. Over the last few years, the uh, European research and education community, uh, namely the NRNs and the GN2 networks, uh, together with some external uh, partners, um, has been introducing and implementing the end-to-end -end services, mainly serving the uh, projects and the NRNs. And these services are crossing multiple domains. That means they are crossing different NRNs. Uh, networks under different management, uh, combining different technologies even. And in order to ensure the high quality, these end-to-end services need to be monitored. That means that the end users have to get enough information to check the health of the network, to check the health of the services. And for the monitoring of those services and networks, users need tools. The tools which help them to quickly identify the problem which can occur in the network and which will help them to solve this problem as quick as possible. So let me take you on a board of this measurement train, hopefully to deliver you to the station which is called multi-domain monitoring service. Uh, to, um, face those challenges with, which I mentioned uh, before, the challenges connected to the mo network monitoring, the personal activity was created. Personal activity uh, works under umbrella of GN2 project. And we can describe it with three main points. So basically, that's a consortium of organizations which gathered together to build the network performance middleware that interoperates across multiple domains. Uh, moreover, it's a protocol. It's a standard protocol using XML messages, which we defined. And in order to have it standardized and have it open and accessible for everybody, we follow the Open Grid Forum Network Measurement Working Group uh, so that the protocol is standardized. And it's not only a design. We are not only talking about the idea. We also have a piece of code. We also have an implementation. And personal is also in a set of code where we implemented web services which are using this personal protocol. 
This picture shows you the basic three layers we identified within Personal. On the bottom layer, which we called measurement point layer, there are measurement points. What are measurement points? They are located within a domain and they can run measurements. They, they provide us with metrics, different metrics with different measurements running and with different measurement points like available bandwidth, like packet loss, like delay. On top of it, the middleware is the service layer, which uh, is a service-oriented architecture and there are multiple services running within multiple domains which are responsible for managing the management, the measurements, as well as for the inter-domain communication and the intra-domain communication too. And on top of it, we have the user interface layer. The user interface provides a nice visualization to the end user so that he can easily uh, look for the data, he can analyze this data, and he can, of course, launch some measurements using the services and the measurement points which are in the layers below. And um, between those layers, there is a protocol defined for personal. What is currently the personal suit? We have a couple of services already under implementation and already running, and some visualization tools too. So within web services set, we have a couple of archives. We call it measurement archives because those services basically store the data. Uh, well, the, the idea was to uh, use already existing data within NRNs. It's very common that the NRNs are using the round robin databases in order to store data, in order to store the SNMP values, for instance. So uh, we developed RRD measurement archive, which can be applied to the currently existing databases within NRNs. For those of uh, them who don't use this kind of databases, we also developed the relational database measurement archive. And there is other type of MA. It's called Hades. It's a proprietary system. These are boxes which, allows us, which allow us to run active measurements. In order to or uh, find those services within the networks, as there could be many of them containing different types of data, we developed a kind of directory service which we call lookup service, which simply stores uh, the information about services, because services may register and deregister from some time to time. And the lookup service allows the user to find out data and the services and the capabilities. Topology service is an important piece. Uh, it's going to be the common topology service for all the NRNs under GN2. It's called CNIS, which is under implementation now. It will serve, for instance, at least for our purposes, uh, as a source of topology data for the visualization tools to uh, make nice maps, for instance. And we also consider an important piece of this service is authorization and authentication service. As the measurement data is a uh, sensitive uh, uh, set of data and uh, not all users should be allowed to, for instance, access the data, but also should not be allowed to run some kind of measurements, for instance, the active measurements. So we have to uh, consider somehow uh, limiting the resources and that's the role of authorization and authentication service. On the lowest layer, we have the measurement uh, point uh, services. So some of them are mentioned here, like BWCTL for uh, measuring the bandwidth, SSH Telnet for accessing the devices and running some show commands, CLI for running command line tools, Layer 2 status MP for providing the layer 2 status end-to-end -end services status. And on, on top of it, we have the visualization applications. There are a wide range of them for different purposes, like uh, the map-like uh, tools, uh, tools which allows us to make some plugins where you can plug in different services, allowing them to be visualized. 
And perf sonar, as it is, serves as a basis for the MDM service. The multi-domain monitoring service we are introducing now gives our users the access to a set of monitoring functionalities. That means they will be able to access metrics which are gathered within different services running in the service, in the MDM service. And they will be able to perform some active test if it's necessary. The service will be offered to a uh, few groups of users. We identified a few groups of users, basically, which I will mention in a second. And they will be able to access the service, of course, based on the policies defined within the networks and the other networks where they want to access data or run measurements. Of course, all these data and services will be accessible through the personal protocol or through the visualization tools. Uh, we have to remember that when we are talking about end-to-end -end measurements, that rather means edge-to-edge. -edge. Uh, there are many domains in between the endpoints, and if we want to have a full picture, in fact, we would, we would like to have the measurement points located in all of the domains on this path. Uh, currently, we are aiming at locating the services within the NRNs and the GN2 networks. So we are not at the very end, but the goal is to be as close as possible to the end institution, having the full picture. That means also involving the regional or metropolitan area networks within the NRNs. On this picture, you can see the separation between the service, which is below the red line, and the user. Below the red line, you can see the domains having installed different measurement points. Then there is a protocol layer with the authorization component and the visualization provided by the GN2 project. And the end user of the MDM service can access the data with two types. So he can access the data using the Persona protocol directly and build his own visualization. It may happen when the user, the project for instance, uh, feels that the visualization tools we are providing are not enough for him. They are not suitable. They are not fitted into their uh, needs. So that they may want to deploy and to implement their own analysis tools. That means this tool will be using the personal protocol in order to access the rest of the service. But if he agrees to use the tools we are providing, that's OK. That will be, he will be authorized on this level, and he will be able to access the same set of data too. I was mentioning uh, the users we are targeting. Basically, we identified three groups. On, let's say, top of it, and the user group we are targeting in the first phase are the network operation centers and the performance enhancement and response teams. PERT was defined under GN2 project, so you probably know what is this. That's a group of uh, network administrators who deal with some performance problems within the network. And network operation centers are considered as a first point of contact within the NRNs. So these are the networking people, the skilled people who operate the network and who know the network and really know what is going there. And they want to access more information in order to debug the problems. And if the users within the network feel that there is some problem with connection, with performance, then they will be uh, then they will call the network operation center so that these two users have to be equipped with proper tools and the service in order to debug problems. Then we have projects and researchers. The end-to-end -end services running over multiple domains are used by different projects. Let's take the radio astronomers who are crossing Europe, the high energy physics. So these are the second group of this is the second group of users we are targeting our service. And finally, there are ordinary users, the staff, the NRN staff, 
who just want to check the health of the network. They may want to see whether it's a, a my network or it's a, under uh, other responsibility. And all those group of users may benefit from the MDM service. So let's, let me uh, first highlight some knock and paired benefits. As knock usually encounter problems between multiple domains, as the traffic, of course, and the end-to-end -end services crosses multiple domains. So the, the traffic doesn't stop at the boundaries of the NRN. And there could be, if we are talking about some project running within Europe, there could be one NRN, then the traffic goes through GN2 network, then there is another NRN at the second end, and there could be also the original network involved. And there could be even more of them if we are talking about some international projects, for instance, if we are uh, linking to some uh, institutions within uh, North America. And they want to have an end-to-end -end view of those services because they are offering some added value services, services and they want to know what is happening in the network. So they may be interesting in having some basic data like link capacity, link utilization, packet drops, the topology. And when they are provided with the MDM service, they will be able to use the standby tools, which are located in multiple domains, to perform some basic tests. So it's not only passive measurement, it's not only observing the network, but also running some on-demand tests or regular tests, like TCP throughput, uh, like delay, like looking glass, so having access to some show comments on the devices. And this should help, us, this should help them to find out where the problem lies. And of course, the lookup service, which I mentioned before, will help them to localize the tools and the capabilities, as there may be many of the services running across multiple networks. So, so the users have to know where it is, where the data is, where are the measurement points I can uh, run tests. And the MDM service will help the users to answer the question, which is the title of the session. So where is my bandwidth? So these kind of tools and this service will help to solve that problem. And also to answer the question, is it the end system making problem or is it a network-based problem? And of course, this uh, service will save time in order to uh, debug the network in a fast way. If we are talking about other users' benefits, like the project users, layer two services, layer three services, uh, here you can see a list of some projects like Radio Astronomers, LHC, EGEE. Uh, they are currently using end-to-end -end services. So they will be able to see the health of their service and to verify the service level agreements they have signed to use the service. And if they feel that the service doesn't, I mean, the visualization tools we are providing uh, do not really fit into the requirements, they will be able to access the data directly with the persona protocol. So to integrate the tools they are having currently, but also to integrate the data they may collecting now. It's important to say that it's not just a design. It's also the implementation now. The personal project is already in the implementation phase. We have a lot of services implemented. And with the MDM service, we're starting with a, a selected set of performance, performance metrics and with a set of services providing data to end users. Uh, within the MDM service, we will go step by step. So we start with the pilot phase, having then the operational phase, so that we'll be able to evaluate how the service works. 
support is an important piece of this service because, well, we could just provide the uh, services, the measurement points, and the documentation, but without the support, the users will be left like in the middle of the dark. So there will be infrastructure to support the personal uh, services as well as the visualization tools. And we start with a small set of participants first with some international involvement. There will be six participants in the pilot phase to launch up the service. This, this table shows you the metrics we are targeting in the first phase. So basically they are also uh, running on different services. So there will be link utilization, link capacity, uh, layer two status. Uh, you will be able to run some show commands accessing, uh, for instance, backbone routers. Uh, the TCP UDB throughput measurements will be able uh, to, 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 to run. And some one-way delay, jitter, packet loss uh, data. They will be available under different range of time. So the latest measurement, historical, on demand. Uh, this will all be served with the use of services we are providing. And as they may serve for different purposes, there will be different locations for different services like backbone links, uh, dedicated project circuits for layer two status, backbone routers, etc. From the development phase and from the beginning of the MDM service, we want to go through three steps. We start with the pilot phase in the middle of this year with five NRNs and GN2 network. And the services will be located in those NRNs and the GN2 network. The main target for this phase is NOC and PERT. These are the users we start with, so we think that they are the most important in this phase, and they will be good candidates in order to validate the services we are running, as they have the best knowledge of the network, and it may be much easier for them to understand also how the services works and uh, where they should, for instance, install the services. So we want to understand the issues of going operational, and to validate the support structure. I already mentioned that we will support the services. So it's important for us to get some feedback from the users in order to improve in future. We also want to test the managed service. Managed service is a special um, kind of the service we are providing, where we are providing a box to the NRN where everything is already installed. So the NRN doesn't have to be involved in the installation and configuration phase. Everything is already delivered there. Then we'll move to prototype, which will um, be continued until April 2008, where more NRNs will be, will be involved. And some projects, some projects which, using, which are using end-to-end -end services will also be added. So they will be able to verify the SLAs. And at this stage, we will have the support team which is dedicated. That means there will always be someone on the MDM side to answer user questions if there is a problem with the service. Finally, in June 2008, we move to operation. At this stage, we want to involve all NRNs, possibly all of them, if possible, and what I already mentioned, we want to be closer to the end institutions. Of course, it's up to the NRNs and projects if they are able to go closer to the end institutions, go closer to uh, project sites. But that will really help in debugging problems. And more projects added, of course. The, the service support, which is an important piece of MDM, is divided into three levels, as there are different responsibilities for different parts of the service. At the first level, we have the central point, the central point of coordination, which is called service desk. It's the first point of contact for all the 
service users, which will deal with incidents, which will answer questions about configuration, about running the services. Uh, it will also track the request for enhancement, if there are any. And at the beginning of installation within the NRNs, it will also support the installation and configuration process in order to help the end users. When the problem begins with running the MDM service, the service desk will start some initial problem investigation. But if he's not able to answer the user question using his own knowledge, the facts, and some documentation, then he will forward this incident into level two. And of course, the service desk will monitor all the services running so that the service desk knows whether they are properly configured, they are running, they are providing data, etc. At level two are developers. These are people who really built the services under JRA1 activity. So they know the details of the services, they know the, the configuration, they know, you know everything about this. And to be sure that they take care of the services properly and they are dedicated, they have enough time for this, they will be subcontracting for three years. So we will be sure that they really work for us. And these developers will answer the questions which are forwarded by level one. They will also fix bugs if there are any in the software, which, well, may happen. And based on the requests for enhancements, they will implement new features too within the services. At the end of this chain, there are administrators, that's the NRN uh, level, uh, administrators manage, manage the services which are located within their networks. Um, that means they secure the services so that they are properly uh, secured in order to not be accessed by the people who are not authorized to do this. They have to assure that the services are available 24 hours per day. So if there is some, I don't know, power outage or something like this, they have to turn it on later on. And they have to be responsible for making those services reachable, so for proper configuration of firewalls, so that the users can access data, can run some measurements too. And of course, as that's the NRN level, that will be the MDM point of contact for the NRN users if they want to deploy the services further and closer to the end uh, institutions. I mentioned that we start with a trial phase and I want to uh, mention the first participants here. So there will be Portugal which will try the managed service, so the box uh, which is already pre-configured and pre-installed. Then there will be Italy, Hungary, Poland, Switzerland and GN2 network. Now those um, networks and all those administrators will be involved in the MDM pilot phase, providing some feedback for the other users and for us. That's the brief, brief introduction I gave you, but if you uh, want to get some more information, if you want to even be involved in the personal and MDM, you may want to be interested into services installation within your NRN, want to uh, try something, please visit www.personal.net where you find many more information about the activity, about the services, uh, as well as you will be able to download the software in order to, to use it. Thank you very much. Since I'm more or less involved in this, um, I have some unclear things about how this all to all end-to-end -end monitoring is supposed to work. So you mentioned your goal is to do end-to-end -end monitoring, right? Yet 
for me as a network operator, it's not very clear what's the added value of this for sonar to my already existing monitoring, right? Because if something happens, I will see, you, you get the data that something happens from me, right? And I will send you the data, and there's no point in you telling me again that something happened, because I already know. So I don't see where the added value of all this, of gathering all this data is. And then the second question is, assuming you actually do this and there is some added value, who is looking at this data? Uh, there's no internet police or anything like that that is supposed to you know, monitor everything. Okay, let, let me answer the, the first question. So, well, the um, available of data, availability of data depends on the network uh, managers. So if, if you say that this data is available for the others, that, that's great. But what we are offering and the added value we think is the uniform way of accessing data. So the same way of accessing data and running measurements will be available through the all networks. So having the same kind of tools, using the same protocol, you will be able to access data which is located in multiple domains. You will not have to use, I don't know, uh, many tools because many NRNs can have different tools within their own uh, responsibility and their own domains. But well, provided to subject to authorization and authentication, you will be able to see the data within other domains. And you will be able to develop your own analysis tool using the protocol we uh, implemented. Uh, next question, please. Uh, the, and the second question was about who is to, oh, who is supposed to look at? Well, the, I mentioned the three groups of users. So first of all, the network operation centers. Uh, currently, in my network, I can only see the uh, data available from my domain. I cannot see the, uh, I don't know, the Portugal network, for instance. So yeah, if my, if yeah, if my serv my end-to-end -end service goes to some project site in in Portugal and crosses a few of networks in between, I I don't want to see where the problem is. Is it in Poland or is it in I don't know Switzerland? Is it in in Portugal? So that I can you know directly uh, call the the manager in in this network. So, so two questions, um, and maybe you've thought about all these already. The first one relates to the folks involved in the trial project. Um, three out of the last five interesting PERC cases involve endpoints outside of Europe. So I would strongly suggest getting together with the Internet2 folks or whatever and seeing if you can integrate them or come to some kind of bilateral agreement so that even during the next year in the pilot phase, we can do better than just monitoring endpoints in, in Europe, right? Um, and then the second thing, the second question or comment is, have you thought about what it would take for someone who is not part of Perf Sonar now, but who suddenly needs to be, like Chile and Tigo, you know, that, that whole per case, to say, Here's a drop-in kit that at least temporarily you can use to enable your NREN and your N systems to become part so of this. Could you, end could you repeat mission. the last sentence? Sure. C have you created or could you create some easy kit for them to temporarily make themselves part of Perf Sonar? The example would be Jean 2 is well monitored, um, but Chile is not. Maybe for two months it would be good to have Chile you know, run perf sonar, maybe forever, but at least for two months. So some kind of easy startup kit to participate, to run down the end-to-end -end problems faster. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was um, almost expecting the first question. Uh, so the, we, we have the international, international involvement now. I mean, we have partners from Internet2, from Brazil even, and the other uh, institutions. The problem with MDM service is that we want to be sure that the service is running and the people who are, who are running the service are available. That's why I mentioned the three-year subcontract. And it's easy for GN2 community because the, the project pays for it. Uh, we, we faced with this question at the last meeting. Uh, we don't have an answer yet because it depends on the institution you mentioned. I mean, if Internet2 wants to 
uh, run this kind of service within North America, uh, that's OK. But the source of uh, funding is different. And we don't know yet how to combine it so that it's a consistent uh, way. But yeah, that's, that's for sure. In order to have the whole picture, we, we need something like this. And as relates to the second question, uh, for those new participants who want to join us, well, there are a couple of ways. Uh, if they want to install the services, the, the bundle, I mean, the software is already available. So they may just want to, uh, they may just go to our web page and download it and install it. There is a user, uh, user um, uh, mailing uh, list which we, which we run. They may ask us questions. And if they want to participate in the development process, they are freely uh, welcome too. So we are open. And uh, if they want to go to us, just, uh, just, uh, just go and, and uh, talk to us. Thank you very much, Simon. One. I'm, I'm sorry for not taking more questions right now. Uh, yeah. You'd have the opportunity to talk to Shimon afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and also, we organize a, a workshop on end to end issues in, in Paris in June uh, 11th and 12th. And I, I, I can give you those details uh, if, if you are interested. Uh, let's thank Shimon for his presentation and for his answering to the questions. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Olaf Kvitem from Uninet. He is the technical director of uh, research and development there. And he's been uh, active in the uh, networking community for uh, 20 years. His research interests are in the areas of network protocols, uh, wireless infrastructure, traffic measurements, and SIP infrastructures. Okay, hello. Um, I'll be talking about uh, essentially the IPFX uh, protocol. I'll uh, tell you about the tool we have made to, to extend the IPFX uh, measurement protocol. I'll tell you about positive measurements. And I'll uh, give you some example numbers that we got using uh, these two. And as uh, Simon uh, told us, it's, uh, we are working on end-to-end uh, uh, measurements. We want to know the quality of the service. And uh, uh, what we traditionally do is by SNMP and active uh, measurements, we do uh, measure, um, tend to measure volumes of packets and on network components rather than measuring the actual quality of the flow of the user. So the goal is then to, to serve the, the end user and have an end-to-end -end view of, of the quality. So that's, that's our driving force. Uh, so, and also traditionally, network statistics has been network engineer oriented and not very much user oriented. So uh, the user deserves the end-to-end -end view. And by using passive probes, which is uh, the core of this talk, we, we can see the actual quality of the flow or see some indications of the quality the end user sees. Of course, you can't see what the quality at the user screen is, but anyhow, we can get a bit closer. And in this process, then, we have uh, worked on the uh, MAPI uh, or, uh, software, which is a measurement API uh, to the passive measurement cards. And uh, this API gives us, as normally, an you know, abstraction, you know, uh, sharing between multiple users. Uh, branching, you, you may uh, look at uh, one flow from different perspectives. Uh, we bring anonymization so that you can uh, not uh, reveal IP addresses and stuff like that. And uh, first of all, we, we uh, have a, an architecture that allows the user of a passive card to, to have a zero copy strategy so that it's very efficient uh, use of uh, uh, data. We, we need that. And then we also have this library contents and functions to uh, uh, ease programming of, of these cards, like uh, filtering, uh, counters, and, uh, and uh, what I'm talking about now, a flow analysis uh, function. 
There, we also uh, made some tools like service detection called Atmon. It's an attack detector. Uh, and, and the flow analysis, uh, 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 which is a flow aggregation tool and a reporting tool and a graphing tool, the stager. We also made a small tool to, to measure the, me the use of bandwidth in sub-second uh, intervals because uh, a user normally needs a response within a second. You need to know what's happening within a second. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the five-minute statistics doesn't help you to tell about the immediate uh, quality of the service for the user. So uh, the flow characterization um, uh, can be done then with, with uh, this MAPI interface. Uh, the clock uh, is done to microsecond level, so you, we can, uh, even on 10 gigabits per second, you can pre precisely identify each packet, or close to, because uh, uh, at, at 10 gigabits per second, the, the, the packet will, be, uh, uh, will last uh, uh, one microsecond. <coughs> uh, so the, the statistics we, we want to make is, is uh, um, statistics for the intensity of the flow and uh, uh, for the intervals of the packets, uh, deducing, uh, um, uh, deducing the, the delay, delay variance uh, and the jitter, jitter of uh, real-time services. Um, and uh, perhaps also, uh, we can also look more into details of the size of the packets. Um, and this can be indications then oh. uh, indications of the quality of the service the user sees. So, so we need to establish a relation between the observed quantities here and the actual quality the user sees. So this tool won't do that, but we can use this tool to get the basic uh, numbers. So, um, I'll uh, take a step back and try to explain what the IPTX uh, flow uh, is. It's an ITF uh, standard, or is becoming an ITF standard. It's inspired by the, by the Cisco NetFlow version 9, uh, heavily inspired in fact. Uh, it's uh, kind of extensible so that you can make your own uh, custom uh, defined record types and, and parameters. And um, uh, the flow is, is defined by a flow key normally. And uh, the standard the five tuple of IP addresses, the transport protocol, and, and the ports, it is uh, a, uh, uh, it, it's what's normally used for flow, like NetFlow or stuff like that. Uh, but uh, within the in fix, you can define your own flow key. So if you want another flow key uh, with another choice of, of parameters, uh, you can do that. So, so, so what is a flow then? It's, it's basically, based on that five tuple, it's basically a, a normal uh, uh, session. Uh, and you don't, it's, it's not always easy to detect when it starts and stops, but uh, anyhow, uh, if it's a, it's a TCP session, you can uh, normally see a, a, a thin uh, flag. Uh, if there's a time gap, we'll also turn out the flow, typically 30 seconds. And uh, uh, we don't record flows forever, so after uh, uh, a few minutes, we would terminate the flow and, and create a new one. And not the flow itself, but terminate the, the gathering of statistics of the flow. Uh, <coughs> so um, normally, uh, you collect the bytes and the octets and the time and the, the uh, easy available uh, statistics in, in the router uh, at the time of, of, of the flow, the autonomous system numbers, the protocol that is being used, stuff like that. And uh, uh, what we pre uh, had tried to do then is to uh, do some more computational uh, oriented analysis of the flow by looking at each packet and the the timing difference between them. So this is going to be done on, on uh, uh, high-speed interfaces like uh, 2.5 and 10 gigabits per second, even higher. So we want to do this in, in, in the backbone. So to make this scale, we, we want to uh, do it on high-speed lines, so we don't want to have meters all over the, uh, the network. And uh, uh, 
the um, and then uh, we, we don't have, at, at 2.5 gigabits, we, we don't have more, with, with present CPUs, we don't have more than 500 cycles uh, per packet. So we need to be very efficient. And uh, we tend to uh, <coughs> compute the cheap, cheap numbers. And uh, uh, that means we can have the count, the sum, and the sum of squares. With the sum of squares, we can compute the standard deviation afterwards. We, you don't have the time to compute it uh, in line. And uh, uh, by that, we also get more significantly statistical uh, numbers, uh, we hope. So we also made a, uh, a packet size distribution uh, parameter list. We have a, we have a predefined uh, uh, <coughs> a packet size uh, interval that we feed into the system. And we, we get an, a, a histogram per flow out of this. We look at the interarrival time, as I said, we're for looking at delays and jitter. We look at the intensity of the flow in, in one, ten, hundred, and uh, thousand millisecond uh, uh, intervals. So we, we hope to answer what is the burstiness of a typical flow or a particular flow. And uh, uh, by looking at the RTP uh, packets, if you can find them, they're not that easy to spot. Uh, but um, uh, we think that uh, the media time uh, within the RTP packet, the sequence number, and the time that the packet passes can be used to, to actually measure the, the real-time uh, jitter of the flow uh, and, and, and the quality of, of a streaming uh, flow. Um, TCP is, uh, is the most used protocol, and uh, we can also analyze the use of TCP. The we can look at the windows typically used. We can look at the, the real window. We can look at the retransmissions and see out of sequence packets. Uh, we can also spot the direction. Who sent the initial SYN? Uh, uh, the TCP. T SYN is a, a way of starting a TCP session. And, uh, and by that, we, uh, if, if, we, if you want to discuss with your uh, peering uh, uh, internet operator, you, you want to discuss who's uh, delivering traffic to whom, uh, knowing who initiated the traffic uh, could be interesting. And uh, we also looked into service classification. And then uh, look into the packet, into the data part, to try to recognize what kind of peer-to-peer -peer protocol is there. Uh, we haven't got very far on that, but uh, we have started. So uh, this is the um, a drawing of, of the system. Then. We, we, ha we have uh, traffic uh, on a link, a splitter, a PC with a passive measurement card. Uh, which is runs this uh, MAPI uh, uh, flow analyzer. The flows are exported or then forked to a collector, which processes reports, store the reports in the database. The database shows the data to the user. Within this system, then, uh, we, we did have, uh, uh, we do have CPU limitations both here and there. And uh, as always, the, the backend storage the disk is not very fast. It's not developing very fast uh, either. So, so uh, that's, that's the three main uh, uh, limiting components of the system at the moment. I'll uh, show you more about the, uh, no, the uh, exporter uh, uh, in a while. Here's an example of, of an end-user report uh, showing the intensity of, of the flows uh, within one second, 100 milliseconds, and, and 10 milliseconds. And you can see there are substantial difference between the minimum and maximum at uh, one second and uh, at 10 milliseconds. And uh, you see that small intervals you know, uh, allow for idle, uh, uh, idle traffic. So you, you need to know what you're looking at and to, to know uh, uh, what kind of burst intensity, the size, the granularity you're interested in. So for the start, we have chosen a, a range of, uh, of burst sizes to, to burst intervals to, to, to get a feeling for where is the most information. Um, this uh, sub-second bandwidth measurement uh, we did to just on a link to, to try to see uh, what the, the sub-second uh, behavior was. And uh, this important uh, is uh, 
shows a normal five minute uh, 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 link uh, uh, graph. And this is the one second and 100 millisecond uh, graphs. And you can see that this 2.5 gigabit per link, uh, which is normally thought to be 60% uh, loaded, in fact, was for one, one second loaded fully. So, but, uh, and, and uh, normally we, we see that the, the, uh, this, this is about, let's say, 30% higher constantly. The, the instantaneous load of the link is, is normally uh, uh, quite much higher than the, the average five minute uh, load. And remember that the user just wants his web page in one second. And uh, uh, so, so now I have collected data from uh, the, uh, our network at a couple of places. So this covers a couple of universities. Uh, it's a few million flows. It's a couple of hours of data. And uh, this is the uh, flow size or the flow length distribution. We kept the flows at 240 uh, seconds. So this is also the flows that are actual flows that are long, longer, but they're not many. <coughs> and it turns out that then the, uh, very many flows are shorter than one second. And uh, there are also a lot of flows that are uh, uh, just one packet. But I, I won't go into that. So th these are the flows we are now investigating. That are flows that last uh, more than one packet because uh, uh, the burstness of one packet is, is known. And uh, we will be looking into flows that are larger than 100 milliseconds just, just to, to see uh, how this uh, uh, part of the uh, flow spectrum performs. Um, so uh, we des decided then to, to look at the source port 80, and that is uh, the web server performance. And uh, we, we also looked at the, uh, who initiated the flow. The, uh, we unit and uh, we tested 9 million flows. Uh, 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 other people um, we tested 6 million flows from us. So that's, that's not a very big uh, difference. But it turned out then that the response flows were uh, much larger than the request, requested uh, uh, flows. So, so that's why data are, is being taken out of, of our network. Of course, there are a lot of uh, 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 unknown flows here. Uh, we, do see, um, we do see both the both directions uh, on, on this uh, link uh, that we look at. So we, we look at the, uh, the party of those two flows, you know, the, uh, the opening flow and the response flow, TCP, so there's always two, two flows uh, when you have a TCP session. And uh, the party that sends the, the first SIN is, is the one that is initiating your traffic. So it could be in interesting information. So here are some typical performance numbers. We do have um, um, this is, these are the uh, these are the uh, top uh, these are the top volume uh, AS's that we uh, uh, talk with, and uh, uh, we see that in the the burst one millisecond bursts are quite large. They are they are 50 megabits per second. Uh, on average, for most ASICs, it's it's these are these are very fresh numbers. So so it might be that is uh, some errors, but it's anyhow it, it look like uh, it looks like uh, we are seeing a clustering um, that comes from let's say operating system uh, in, in the in the servers uh, uh, scheduling uh, and also. We also know that the high-speed network cards do uh, buffer a uh, large amount of data. Uh, I looked at one card, and it seemed to be buffering. Uh, I looked at one paper on this, and um, <coughs> these cards seem to be buffering at uh, the size of hundreds of microseconds. So 
I, I would not expect uh, just the buffering in, in uh, interface cards uh, to, to explain this, this uh, clustering. Might be some queuing uh, in routers in, in front of a link. So it could be interesting to see why, why the max intensity of, of, of the flow is, is uh, in fact quite larger than the, the average of a TCP flow. So you see that the typical normal uh, suspended rate of <laughs> a total of 100 milliseconds, it's, it's about a couple of megabits normally for, for uh, that, that's the top performance. Remember then that a lot of flows vary in the size between 100, and one 100 milliseconds and one second. So, so, so this is the, the typical performance, and this is the burst performance that we, that we see uh, here. And uh, we also then computed the, the effective window in TCP by seeing the uh, opposite ACK coming back, and you see looking at the current sequence number of the packet uh, in, in the forward direction. We measure the effective window. And we can see that uh, this is quite surprising then, that uh, uh, we do have both directions of flows here, both from our side to, to the world and from the world and back. And uh, uh, when you observe a TCP and want to measure the effective window, you should be close to the source. But in this uh, material, there will be a lot of uh, a destination close also to the measurement point. So you need to sort that out in order to have a sound correlation between effective window and the performance seen from the AS. Anyhow, this report tells me uh, what is the performance of the autonomous system I'm talking about. So if you want to change uh, your upstream partner, you might want to look at these kind of numbers to see w which is the most performing uh, 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 pro provider. <coughs> Another uh, thing lo looked up was, was uh, auto-sequence TCP packets. That is, we observe for a TCP stream, we observe that um, the uh, sequ sequence number of the current packet is lower than the sequence number of the previous packet. And uh, the reason for this could be that it's a uh, retransmission, that is, the packet has to be retransmitted because it has been lost. Uh, or it can, could have been reordered by, by the network, and we know that both things are happening. So uh, this test is not, not very good at the moment. Uh, we think that perhaps we could improve it by, by looking at the retransmission uh, time. Uh, you know, it would be a round trip time. You know, if, if it's a lost packet, the retransmission will be uh, delayed by a, re by a round trip time uh, to, to, the, to the actual uh, uh, sequence number seen, seen, seen on the wire. So, so um, uh, and I think that the reordered packets would be uh, very much shorter interval. So if you see a packet, uh, re re an auto sequence uh, packet that is very short time from, from the previous sequence number, you can assume it's a, a, uh, uh, it's a reordered by the network. It just happens in some routers that, uh, that uh, packets are being uh, uh, reordered by the uh, switch matrix in, in the router. Um. <coughs> so, so uh, it, it could be difficult and to be very conclusive about this, but uh, I did a measurement of, of the diverse performing uh, uh, ASs that we talked to. And uh, um, this time I made sure that these flows, these flows uh, uh, goes in the right direction. So these are the flows going from us to other ASs. So now I, now I can be sure that the uh, efficient window is, is uh, more, more, more closer to the real effective window, uh, which uh, is, is being seen by the source. And uh, I choose to look at the 10 millisecond and the 100 millisecond uh, uh, burst uh, uh, performance. And uh, we measured the uh, auto sequence rate. So th this is the percentage of the packets that we are uh, auto order. So some ACs do have a very large rate of uh, either reordering or, uh, or packet loss. A and there is a strong correlation between a higher increasing uh, reordering or, or auto sequence uh, measurement and 
uh, the corresponding performance, down to a few hundred kilobits for, for the high loss or high uh, uh, rewarding networks. Uh, remember the previous file uh, where, where we had the typical once one second or 100 millisecond uh, performance loss in the order of two megabits here it's in the order of a few hundred uh, kilobits so so it, it's it's a clear indication that uh, that the uh, the uh, effective window go down uh, <coughs> as the uh, uh <coughs> the uh, out of uh, sequence uh, numbers go up so so here we have an uh, indicator of a poor, poor performing AS, not, not AS. The, this, as this is a destination AS, it could be any AS in between. So, so you, you should be careful about blaming uh, uh, who still. <coughs> and um, so no, no use for some of the numbers that uh, we are able to, to, to get. And, uh, I presented you the um, numbers for ASs. Uh, you can also make aggregations on IP prefixes on, or on uh, individual addresses to see the most performing IP, the most or the worst performing web ser services. Uh, the find the uh, uh, backbone network or the uh, find the subnet that is the least performing. Why is it least performing? Yeah, uh, why don't we look into that? So. I think we can use this uh, statistics in, in various ways to, to evaluate the performance of uh, the end-to-end. -end. And use that performance to, to dive into the network to find the real reasons. This won't tell you why, but... Uh, so, uh, we want to develop this further. And we have a CPU bottleneck, so we need to go into more CPUs in the, in the exporter go into parallelism to go to 10 gigabits. We can perform at 2.5 gigabit uh, load, but not at 10. So more CPUs. Might be that we want to offload the hardware. And uh, we also have a CPU uh, problem with the report generator. You know, we, we couldn't sustain real-time reporting uh, for a long time. So we need to have more efficient code, and we are in need of a good IPTX reporting tool. Tell me about it if you know one. So, to sum up, we have positive uh, flow measurements that can uh, measure performance and indicate quality, not prove quality. Uh, we do know some f a bit more about person flows. Uh, we can do uh, we can analyze TCP. We hope to improve our RTP uh, measurements. There is still. Uh, we need to find techniques to identify RTP. We do see that application looking into packets is quite demanding at the rate we are talking about. So there's more work to be done. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olav. I think we have time for one or two short questions. Uh, my name is Paul Boven, I'm from Jive in the Netherlands. Uh, we do a lot of large uh, bandwidth streams. In order to analyze a stream with the IPFIX software, would I need to completely capture every packet on a separate uh, monitoring station? Uh, if I want to do th things like analy analyze the uh, out of order sequence and stuff like that, and how would that scale if, for instance, I have 16 uh, streams of one gigabit that I need to monitor? Well, uh, yeah, I think you can do that. And you, of course, you will need to uh, see every packet. Y yes, you would n need to see every packet. And uh, so uh, I think the, uh, the uh, 10 gigabit uh, measurement cards are able to, to uh, catch every packet. Uh, what, is, what we need to do is, is to improve the, uh, uh, the analysis uh, uh, CPU performance to extend from 2.5 to 10. So, so yes, you can see uh, a lot of one gigabit flows in parallel, yes. So we do produce flow, flow records. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that is the basic idea here. It's a 
to, pro to produce pro records, which is a scaling way of aggregating traffic. So, and then analyze the pro records in afterwards. Oh yeah, see, of course, you need one mirror per uh, per optical circuit you want to tap into. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Our next speaker is Mathieu Goutel, who is a network engineer in the networking team at CNRS in in uh, France. He's also the activity leader of SA2, the, the service activity for network, network support in the EGE project. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. So thank you, Catherine. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I will present you here uh, the experience we have gained in uh, running the optical private network for LCG. So basic outline of my talk, I will first introduce the, the context where we are working and what, is, uh, what are the, 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 the issues we are trying to tackle regarding the, uh, the operations of uh, an optical private network. I will then uh, go into details of the uh, two uh, concepts and entities we have created to run this, uh, the, the operations, to run this network, how do they interact, and I will then uh, conclude on a more broad uh, view of wh what, we, what we have done. So basically the context is um, we, we have two sites uh, and you want to uh, to connect them. So uh, the the good the solutions that comes to mind rather quickly is to create what we call now light pass and two end circuit point to point circuits whatever you you call it. So a, a dedicated links in uh, in between those two sides and you can ask this kind of uh, of dedicated links. To European NRNs, it's uh, it's obviously uh, available also in the U.S., in Asia, and all over the world. So this is th this is the solutions the the, the, the solutions you, you want to, to choose. But the the fact is that you may have to connect many sites, and so the pictures can become a little more complex. And so you have your dedicated links now between, uh, between your sites. And you have in between the network. And uh, this could be a lot easier if, it, if it's one network domain. But of course, it is not. It's a lot of network domains, depending on different administ uh, uh, under different administrative responsibilities, with different monitoring framework, with different uh, uh, operational procedures, with uh, different languages, with what many many differences. And this is uh, this is exactly the case where we stand after the um, the the network for, the, uh, for LCG has been designed. We were in these situations where uh, we wanted to link uh, CERN with sites all over the world. And this doesn't only raise uh, issues about uh, monitoring, about also designing this network, because having all these network domains cooperating to build this end-to-end uh, -end light pass is also a, a, an issue. But it also raises operational uh, concerns. So basically, the, the picture is like this. You have, uh, I will say, two worlds. Uh, two worlds. So I on, on the left, oh, OK. Yep. So on the left, the, I will say, your project, your whatever you, you wanted to call it. So the, the things 
for what you are working and you are building this network and the network domains. So in our case, Venerance and Gen2. It can be also European Enerance, but also uh, US Enerance, GIA, et cetera. And on the operational sides, you started to have this mess here where all the sites are talking with the Enerance, with, uh, with uh, all the network domains that are in relations for their particular dedicated circuits. This is not what you wanted because it's, it, this, this can become unmanageable. So the ID is trying to concentrate this flow, this, this flow of information, of operational information in one place, and also trying to involve GN2, which was not in the previous, uh, in the previous case, as a pan-European network. It doesn't have direct, I would say, direct relationship with the sites. And also trying to involve your particular support units which are not uh, in direct relations with Venerans. And what we're trying to, to create is two entities. Uh, so what we have called, so the ENOC, I would, I, would, I would call it the Project Network Operation Center because so it can be, uh, I, I, want it, I want to be uh, more, general than, uh, more generic than only for LTG. And GN2, on the sides, I've created the end-to-end -end coordination unit. And uh, the, the rationale behind this is that uh, GN2 has in mind that this end-to-end -end coordination unit can serve for many, many projects. So you will have here a particular project and many projects that, that, are, that are using this light pass can uh, use the same entity here, the end-to-end -end coordination entity. That, that's why we separated uh, those two. So I just remind you here, what are the rationales behind this, uh, this, this two concepts? So first, solve the multi-domain issues. I mean, we will concentrate the various network domains within the end-to-end -end coordination unit. The end-to-end -end coordination unit will then communicate with the project NOC, and then the project NOC will forward these informations to the various entities which can be evolved in a, in, in a project. So the sites, the support units, whatever you can imagine. Of course, doing this, we are also streamlining the communication channel. Uh, you don't want to all the sites communicating with all the elements. This is unmanageable. And you also have a central repository first to filter the informations, having experts doing the, all the consolidation of the informations. And doing this impact assessment. I mean, not forwarding to users, for example, that a particular circuit is down or may be down or have a slight impact on performance and whatsoever. And just doing, uh, pass, uh, forwarding the right information at the right level to, to the right entity. So just a few words about the, the LHTOPN. I don't want to go into details. I think, I think it has been presented, uh, uh, already presented. Just to show you uh, the complexity we, uh, where we are now. So you have CERN, uh, the central sites, and all the sites uh, in Europe and all over the world. I mean, there are US sites uh, here, here, here it's in Canada, here it's in Taiwan, and uh, all the others are more or less in, in Europe. So this is rather complex. I mean, this, this simple links uh, behind these simple links, a lot of complexity is hidden. A lot of network domains are, 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 are involved. And this network should serve uh, to, to get out uh, the terabytes of data that are produced at CERN by the, by the, uh, in the LHC. And uh, to get out this data and this, uh, into the, the computer centers for them to be stored uh, more, uh, more permanently. And so this is a crucial building blocks of, uh, for LHC because uh, this data needs really to be, get, to be taken out of CERN because there is only a, a temporary um, uh, storage at CERN is only temporary. I mean, there are not enough space to, to, to cope with all the data that are produced. So they need this data to get out of CERN. 
So first, I will try to describe the end-to-end -end coordination unit in more detail. So the purpose, the, the, the basic purpose, is to communicate, uh, so to gather all the, um, the operational information on the links, on the status of the end-to-end -end links of operational status, I mean on-off status only, and uh, try to forward these information to the, uh, to the uh, appropriate entity, so the, the domains that are involved and the insights through the, through the project node. And so the responsibility is first to monitor the state of all end-to-end -end circuit. Here I mean by indirectly that they are not really monitoring, they are just taking the information from, uh, from, the, from the monitoring framework and uh, gathering it in a, in a central place. It's, it's also following up all the incident and the maintenance that are planned in the, in the networks and uh, trying to forward this, uh, they, they are also forwarding these information to, uh, to the operational entities at sites and, for the, and to the project NOC. They will also uh, troubleshoot and, uh, no, not, not really troubleshooting, but they are also uh, following up the incidents that are raised in, uh, for example, by the project or by another NOC, uh, to to coordinate all the all the all the actions uh, to solve a particular issues. So what I would like to stress also is that this monitoring is done using Persona. So, uh, for example, coming back to the to the first presentation, this is a particular good uh, example uh, as a, as a user for. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> for some this kind of uh, high layer uh, uh, central repository for monitoring information. So the project, uh, the project uh, NOC. So basic pur purpose is to have uh, some kind of uh, of uh, of uh, overlay view of the network we are trying to build. So. Uh, you can see it as an interface for the project with the network domains. And as such, it receives all the notifications of incident maintenance from the network and uh, try to filter these information and, uh, and forward the right one to the, the, the relevant one to the, to, to the users, to the project, I would say. And it will also uh, receive for example, requests from, the, from, uh, from users saying that, oh, okay, I, I think that the network is behaving badly or I have a problem reaching this particular site and so And it will try to filter also, be an interface, I mean, really. So the scope is exactly uh, this between the, the two entities. So the, the project NOC uh, is on the project side, so it will basically uh, handle the service provided to the user, so the IP network you are building on top of the end-to-end uh, uh, end circuits, and the end-to-end -end CU is only concerned by the layer two, I mean the physical, uh, the physical, uh, the physical links, la uh, up to layer two. And of course, they may have some, some overlap between the two. So I mean that, for example, sites may be one of uh, the same incident both by the ENOC and the n 2 ncu At different level, I mean, they can receive uh, a mail, for example, from, uh, from the n 2 ncu saying that these dedicated links will go down and they will receive a ticket from the same ticket, I would say, another ticket for the same incident saying that the service between those two sites will go down, which can be different, I mean, because of the, uh, the reliability, the backup links, and this sort of thing, the service, the, the links can go down, but the service may be only, uh, uh, may be only degraded. So it can be a difference, but can be some, some overlap. So going into detail in the end-to-end -end coordination unit, this entity was so created as part of, uh, of GN2, and uh, it's only concerned, as I said, by uh, the operational status of this point-to-point -point links. So, light fast point to point circuits, optical circuits, whatever you can call it. So on off status of these circuits. And uh, of course, uh, it's not concerned by the IP, the IP layer. So what is built on top of these end to end circuits 
it's also not concerned by the, the inside connectivity. So I mean, the, 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 the network equipment, which is in the inside. And also, it is not uh, the right entity to deal with new circuits. And uh, so, as I said, they are using uh, PEPSONAR to, to, to monitor the end to end links and uh, doing some fault detection. So, and uh, so they are raising. Uh, oh. So they are raising trouble tickets on open faults or maintenance, and they are coordinating all the actions uh, uh, needed to raise, to raise an issue, for example. They are also reporting monthly to Dante about uh, availability of, uh, of the circuits and uh, quality, overall quality of uh, the service provided. So. Uh, the, the, the status, so this has been the, so this is now part of the giant 2 NOC. This is uh, an half FTE since the beginning of the year. This is, of course, as I already said, not limited to, to LCG. I mean, currently is, there is another project which is called IG, IGTMD, which is using this end to end CU. Probably DESA will use it later. So it's raising uh, trouble tickets to, to, to the users. So but, but, but in our case, uh, the sites and the ENOC. And uh, so currently, it's also using a database, which is, I would say, quite basic. This is an, an Excel spreadsheet. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's likely to, to, to use, in the future, the, the future uh, CNES uh, database which is currently being designed within uh, the Gen2 project. And all the, perhaps the, the data that are collected and uh, provided by personas are integrated in the, in the monitoring tools the Gen2 NOC is using. So this is Nagios. And this is the tools they are using to raise alarms and uh, save historical status and all these the things you can imagine. So this is. Uh, 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 an, a screenshot of uh, the kind of information you can uh, you, you you may see if you go to to a website where you have all the different uh, the different status between the, the links. So here you have, uh, for example, uh, the the link between CERN and the and the, the German sites, which seems to be up. There are some that are not, uh, not really uh, completely monitored, so they are not in a, in, a, in, a, in a good operational status. So if you click on a, on, a, on, a, on a particular link, you have a detailed status of all the continuity and all the various network domains. We want it to be hidden exactly by the end-to-end -end CU. So this is the end-to-end CU, which is dealing with this multi-domain issues. And from our point of view, the, from the project point of view, you don't even see this network domain now. You just, you just only see the point to point domain. So I mean, side to side. Now, going to, uh, going to the project now. So uh, we are doing service level support. It means that as soon as we receive an incident or a maintenance notice from the N2NCU, -N we will see how the, uh, the, the, how, how the network will behave because of the backup, for the resilience we, are, we have the network uh, has built in. We need to know if uh, traffic will be rerouted or whatever. So this is our, go uh, our, our role to assess this, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of impact. And then we will forward this information to the, to the site we use the supports and follow up the, is the issue until it is closed by the end to end CU. We, of course, have by any means not the responsibility of modifying any equipment within the site or within the network. We are just a coordination entity. This, is, this, this statement also, also is, is also uh, of, um, stands also for the end to end CU. It doesn't touch any equipment, it's the role of the, of the NRN NOX. We are also using a database. This is not an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this is a true database. 
And uh, we are also monitoring the routing status because this we are monitoring the service level, so we, are, we need to know uh, how the routing is, is behaving in, a, in, in this network. And we are also using uh, classical uh, IP uh, monitoring tools to know how the performance uh, is in, in the, this network, how the TCP flow are behaving, and, and so on. So the ENOC is, uh, is implemented as part of the EG project, which is uh, closely linked with LCG. This is uh, um, two, two full-time equivalents. So not only for, for LCG, not only for this uh, particular, the monitoring of this particular network we are doing, many other things. And if you are interested, I just sit there. Two um, important uh, documents describing what we are doing exactly. For, for the uh, for the Enoch. so we are basically doing the same kind of things, but for the wall IP connectivity of the sites. So we are the network support unit for the EG overlay network. So this is about 300 sites over 40 countries. So we are doing quite a bit of work with only these two these two full time equivalents. So this is a map uh, we have for the OPN from our point of view, taken from our database. So, uh, and this is a map of the service status as we can show it to the users. So a simplified map of how the service is uh, currently. So in red, in, in, sorry, in green, all is working nicely in, in both directions. In, uh, in blue, it means that uh, the, uh, the, side, the CERN can reach RAL by uh, external means, I would say. And in black, it means that we don't have uh, currently the information. Now we're going to the interaction and procedures of these two entities. So it, it has been more or less touched in the, in the previous slides. I will just now summarize. So you have the end-to-end -end monitoring system, which is persona. So you have the measurement archive and the measurement uh, points that are deployed in the various networking domains that are providing uh, um, a slice of uh, of uh, of point-to-point uh, -point circuits. If something breaks, uh, the monitoring system will uh, will provide these informations to to the end to end CU via the monitoring systems. Then the end to end CU will propagate these informations to the various NOCs and to the project NOC, and then the project NOC will go back to the, to, the, to, to the sites and the end users to warn about the, the impact on the services. Concerning procedures, we are uh, more or less uh, uh, we know uh, the procedures we are, we are following currently, but we need to formalize exactly what uh, is the exact, uh, the exact path each the exact uh, process, each team has to follow in case of an incident, a maintenance, uh, something, whatever can, can uh, happen in this, uh, in this network. So we, need cur we, we are currently formalizing this in a document, in an operation handbook, we call it. And this should, uh, this should uh, tackle all the, kind of, all the entities and all the kind of events that can happen in, in this network. This is, of course, not really new. I mean, each project not can do this. The fact is that we need here to, uh, to describe uh, the, the role and the uh, uh, behavior of all these coordination entities that are quite new. As a conclusion, uh, I think that end-to-end uh, -end secrets, I mean, light pass, we, we, we hear about this for quite a long time. But so using this, this light pass, a project, uh, an institute, can build its own, its own network. And it need to, uh, a pro this uh, project then need to operate it, as a NRNs is doing it for years. And uh, we have uh, now, with the end-to-end -end coordination unit, the, the right interface for projects to, uh, to, to operate. Uh, the network built on top of these end-to-end circuits. And a project needs also to, to remind that 
if it tries to, to build its own network, it needs also to, to have some kind of project knock, as we do. And it needs also to formalize all the procedures that he is going to put in place to operate this network. I mean, this is not new, but this is new for projects that are building this kind of network. So just, just before, I would like just the GN2 colleagues just asked me to, to, uh, to put a word on this. They are uh, uh, doing some kind of end-to-end -end coordination unique demonstration in the stand. So if you, have, if you want to uh, ask some questions and have more details on the end-to-end -end coordination units, they have, uh, they have some extra information in the stand. And I would like also to take the opportunity, if you're interested in EG and grid, uh, grid stuff, please, uh, please uh, take the opportunity of this EG conference in uh, October in Budapest to go and see what we are doing uh, in all over for applications, infrastructures, and many, many things. So thank you. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, one or two short questions. You mentioned that you are using a perf sonar uh, to do something. Uh, it wasn't clear to me what exactly you are looking with using perf sonar if you have separate lambdas and fibers for this infrastructure. Do you are just looking at the LAN switches at the edges uh, at the tier one sites or something? So um, basically, uh, these point-to-point -point circuits are constituted of uh, slices uh, provided by uh, different networks domains. And they are, uh, they are just uh, at layer two. So uh, the, the, the status, so, so it depends, of course. But OK, so uh, the fact is that you have slices of uh, trunks of, uh, of links in different domains. And the status, the operational status, I mean the on-off status, are the links up or down, is uh, published uh, so by the NRNs, by the, by the network domains, in persona. And then the n 2 ncu is taking these informations or either push or pull, I, it depends on the, on, on the system. And uh, they are just using this, uh, uh, this information to detect incidents. So what is in persona is exactly the operational status of the different slice of the point-to-point -point circuit. As was said in uh, several of the other presentations about Persona, they use the um, schema developed by the OGF uh, Network Measurements Group. And what you've told us to d just now is a very nice extension to those schema uh, to display and exchange information about the status of the links, which wasn't in the original um, ideas. Uh, those schema are becoming an international draft standard, so they are open for all frameworks to use, and Persona is uh, uh, with us in developing this. What, what maybe I would like also to stress is that uh, we, we are uh, really relying on Persona here, and this, just, uh, just this is uh, about monitoring things that are both in the US, in the Asia, and all over Europe. I mean, this, uh, I, I'm not sure that without Persona, we were, we were able to do these kind of things. I mean. OK, let's thank Mathieu one more time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much to all attendees for this session. This was the last presentation. Um, there will be lunch served in the cafeteria. And then, uh, of course, th there will be other sessions later in the afternoon. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. While you, while you are leaving, I, I would like to remind you that we are running an online evaluation form for the quality of the presentations. So uh, you should have received a code in your email 
then please use this code, log into the evaluation form, and I was told by my colleagues that uh, once you fill in five evaluations, then you'll receive a code, uh, and, and then you can go and claim a small gift from the Terrena stand. <laughs>